Good morning, everybody. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. So I would encourage you to turn there. I will have it on the screen for you, but if you want it in your lap, go ahead and be turning to Luke chapter 19. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for being with us. If you're visiting with us, we're grateful that you chose to be here. We know you could have made a lot of other choices, and so we're glad that you chose to be with us. We hope that you'll have a friendly, warm welcome before you leave. So stick around just a couple of minutes after service, and there'll be somebody, I'm sure, that will greet you. Let me remind our members, we started a couple of weeks ago a prayer ministry. There's a list out in the foyer. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to begin that. And we're trying to figure out the best way to deliver the things that we want you to pray for, requests that we have as it relates to our church here, as it relates to our leadership and classes and sermons and people who need prayer. And so there's still some time to sign up on that sheet out in the foyer. It's on the A-team board out there. And we would encourage you to sign up for that. And we're grateful to everybody who has already signed up for that. So thank you very much if you have. We're going to be in Luke 19. So we're going to start in verse 45 of Luke 19 as we started a series a couple of weeks ago as Jesus walks to the cross during the last week of his life. We're going to kind of pick up on some things that Jesus experiences and see as we prepare for Easter Some lessons, I think, from the life of Jesus. Luke 19, starting in verse 45. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. So Mark started this series a couple of weeks ago by preaching on that story of Jesus and Lazarus. We know because we have the luxury of looking back through time Jesus is about to go to the cross. We know what he's about to do. We know what is about to play out. But they didn't. Not fully. Jesus is on his death march to the cross. To sacrifice himself as a ransom. The people around Jesus didn't know exactly what was happening. And it's at the point... When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, that we start to see that Jesus is really unfolding for everybody around exactly what he is about. So he enters into Jerusalem. This triumphal entry that represents Jesus' humility, but also his popularity at the time. And then as we probably should expect, Jesus goes to his father's house. Now this isn't the first time that Jesus has been to the temple, right? He was there as a child. He was there at the first part of his ministry with a similar experience. And now toward the end of his ministry... He walks back up those steps. He walks back up to that place of worship. And what we probably should expect from Jesus at this moment is for him to open his mouth and to give some kind of eloquent teaching, some kind of eloquent message about God. We should think that Jesus is probably fixing to quote some Old Testament text And talk about how he is the fulfillment of that Old Testament text. That's not what happens. At least not at first. Jesus filled with righteous indignation 
drives out people in the temple. This is what matters right now. Jesus is angry. And that's not a way that we see Jesus very often, is it? When we think about Jesus, we don't think about Jesus as angry very often. Now, when the text says that Jesus drove people out of the temple, what the text is trying to illustrate is that there was a physical confrontation. At the very least, there would have been some elevated voices. And you've been in situations like that, I'm sure, at some point in your life. And most people are not very comfortable in those situations, are they? When people are shouting, that's what's happening. Jesus is talking to people loudly and through whatever method motivating them to leave the temple. Now his statement, my house should be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers, is a statement from Isaiah 56. In that text, the temple was a place of peace and a place of prayer, at least it was supposed to be, for all the people to come and meditate on God. But it wasn't that. What's interesting to me on the surface of this text is what Jesus does first. So you got to get in mind as Jesus is walking to the cross, Jesus walks into Jerusalem. He walks up the hill to the temple and he goes straight to his father's house. You know what he doesn't do? He doesn't go to Pilate's hall, at least not first. He doesn't go talk to the Romans, at least not first. He goes and he talks to religious people. Now there, the politics of this day were a mess. They were a mess. And Jesus doesn't deal with that first. It's not that he's not interested in that, but Jesus goes and he talks to religious people first, which is interesting, right? Jesus doesn't try to to sort out the government of Rome until he goes to the temple first. So sometimes we picture Jesus and what Jesus would do if Jesus showed up in the 21st century. You know the first thing that Jesus would do? Before Jesus went to the White House, Jesus would go to the church. Jesus would go to religious people before he went to officials. Jesus would spend time with so-called religious people before he spent time with anybody else. His primary purpose, his first purpose, was not Roman occupation. And it was horrendous what the Romans were doing. It's corruption in the faith. And so he goes straight to the temple because he is concerned with religion first. Jesus cared about all the things that people cared about. But he cared first about religion. He cared first about faith. Jesus goes straight to the temple and confronts the corruption of faith and stayed there, the text says, every day and taught and confronted issues about faith and religion, about leadership and the way that it was all working. So maybe you ask yourself, you read this text and you say, what in the world is Jesus upset about? Why is he mad? Because Jesus is mad. He's angry because of what he sees. So why is Jesus mad? Now, growing up, I always heard that the implication of this text was to say, don't ever come to church and talk about business. Right? When you come through the door, don't ever talk about business. Because what Jesus is upset about is the fact that they have mixed business with worship. That's not what's going on. At least that's not the most important thing of what's going on. What's happening here is way more terrible than that. There's this court outside of the temple called the Court of the Gentiles. And it was a little bit of ways from the temple, but there was this whole compound that was around and surrounded the temple. And what the Jewish leaders had done is they had turned the court of the Gentiles into a business trade facility. Now, court of the Gentiles is named that for a reason. It was a place for people who were not Jews to come and worship God, the God of the Jews. And what the Jews had done is taken away the opportunity for people who were not like them had taken away their opportunity to worship God himself. 
and in its place had set up a business and trade guild. There were literally things that were bought and sold on the grounds of the temple. So every Jew, and for that matter, even Gentiles who would come to that court, had to sacrifice to God. They sacrificed cattle and livestock. The poorest among them sacrificed pigeons. And it was widely known in the first century that if you wanted to come and you wanted to bring your own animal, you had the opportunity to do that. But nine times out of ten, the priest would look at the animal that you brought to sacrifice and he would inspect it and he would say, it's not good enough. You can't use this. It's got blemish because God only wants the best, right? But wouldn't you know it, for all of those people who had brought their own livestock, who had brought their own pigeon, and the priest had turned down because it wasn't good enough, right outside these doors, there's a place you can buy some. You can buy some livestock. You can buy some pigeons at ten times its value. And so everybody would come in. They would bring their own animal. They would bring their own livestock. They would bring their own pigeon. And the priest would say, no, not good enough. You can go out and you can pay ten times what it's worth to buy a priest-ordained part of, of livestock, of cattle or pigeons. And you can be assured that God will be satisfied with the sacrifice that you have made to him. Do you see what's happening? And they were taking that money, and rather than putting that money within the treasury of the worship of God, they were lining their own pockets and building their own houses and planting their own vineyards. They were getting rich off the backs of people who were trying to sacrifice to God. So there really is no modern day equivalent for us. But I want you to picture this. If it was your responsibility to bring the Lord's Supper for yourself, to bring your own emblems, right? Your own juice, your own cracker to worship every Sunday. And you had Jerry and you had Ray standing at the door. And they had to inspect what you brought, your crackers and your grape juice. And as you came in and you tried to give them this and show them this, that you were trying to be pleasing to God, nine out of ten of you, If they looked at you and said, not good enough, but we'll sell you a little cup of grape juice for $10. And we'll sell you a little cracker that kind of tastes like styrofoam, right? For $5. How would you feel about that? And then on top of that, if what they did with the money was to plant gardens at their own house, how would you feel about that? Do you think you would say something about that? Do you think you would feel like there was some injustice going on as you tried to do the right thing by coming to worship of God himself? Do you think that you would feel like you were taken advantage of because men who were supposedly your leaders were getting rich by doing what you knew you had to do anyways? This is what's happening. This is what's going on. And so Jesus walks in and he sees this. And how do you think Jesus feels? Jesus throws tables. I mean, literally picks their tables up and throws them. What would your response be if somebody walked in here right now and turned this table over? What would you do? How would that feel? Because that's what Jesus did. In a setting that's not dissimilar from this, Jesus walks in and he throws tables. I don't know how many of you are packing, but you would probably make sure that you had it, right? If somebody came in and threw a table in the middle of church, right? That's what it would have felt like to have seen this experience. That really uncomfortable, I don't know what's about to happen. This is out of control. And not only is Jesus present for this experience, but Jesus is the one who throws the table himself. He's the one who tips the table himself. People 
were being manipulated under the pretense of faith. Yeah, and Jesus cares about that. He absolutely cares about that. It's not just that people were coming in and talking about their business. It was that people were being manipulated into giving money for something that they shouldn't give money for. Religious leaders were using their opportunity to lead to get rich. And Jesus is upset. The high priest, Annas specifically, were extorting people. You know, I think we've seen a lot of movies about Jesus, or maybe, maybe it's just this, this creation in our own mind, but typically when we think about Jesus, we think about Jesus as like this monotone master teacher. Jesus was a carpenter's son. And it wasn't a carpenter like we think of that's moving two by eights or two by fours. Jesus was a carpenter who worked with stone. And Jesus was on construction sites. And Jesus would have seen both people being taken advantage of and how people returned in kind to people being taken advantage of. Jesus wasn't this soft-spoken master teacher who's always kind of monotone and even keel. Jesus got excited. Jesus cared deeply. Jesus was willingly confrontational. He wasn't overly confrontational. But he was willingly confrontational. He wasn't weak. He wasn't soft-spoken. Jesus in this text is angry. I think the world that we live in today is the kind of place that would look at a religious person who's angry because things are the way that they are and would say, you're crazy. I think the world that we live in today wants us to believe that we need to like live and let live. Don't bother anybody, right? Don't bother anybody. You do your thing, I'm going to do my thing, right? You do your thing, I'll do my thing. Don't bother anybody. Don't get excited about nothing. It's okay, I guess, if you want to believe what you believe, but don't, don't enforce that on anybody else. Live your truth, right? Don't judge. Be accepting. This isn't the way of Jesus. At least not when people say that today, what they mean. If your anger at something in the world today is righteous, then it's the right kind of anger. If you have righteous indignation at something in the world today, and you know that this is the way of Jesus, then I think that's okay. Sometimes maybe the reason that things persist in the world today is because there are so many people in the church that aren't angry enough in the right kind of way. How much do we face today in the world? How much of that exists because there aren't enough people who are angry about it? Christianity was never supposed to be this kind of passive, blasé kind of religion like it's treated today. We talked about it in Bible class this morning, right? It's okay to be angry. If that anger motivates you to fulfill righteousness. So Jesus confronts righteously. He teaches for a time. And because Jesus does what he does, he cuts into the profit stream of the religious leaders of the day. Are you beginning to see why they wanted him dead? It wasn't just because he was teaching what he was teaching. It wasn't just because he was doing what he was doing. It's because Jesus was cutting into their money. Because Jesus turned over tables and people started to follow that message. Even for a short period of time, there were people who were not paying for their animals. He was taking money out of the pocket of the high priest. And death comes short after. So yeah, this is an interesting text. And it's a heavy text. Let me ask you a couple of questions as we close this morning. Are there some things that should make you more angry? I'm talking godly, righteous anger. What injustices do you see in the world 
and maybe in the church where we need some more anger. Are you willing to be angry? This way. I'm not talking about sinful anger. Are you willing to be angry? And what are you willing to let that anger motivate you to do? We started this year talking a whole lot about prayer. Every Sunday, for the bulk of the first part of this year, every Wednesday night in Bible class, for the bulk of the first part of this year, talking about prayer. I think one of the easiest ways for you to see if you're angry or not, the way of Jesus, the way Jesus is angry, is for you to survey the things that you pray about. What have you prayed for this year? What requests have you made on behalf of other people? Who have you interceded for? What have you interceded about? What do you see in the world today that needs the Lord's intervention? Mark said several weeks ago that prayer is rebellion, and that stuck with me. Prayer is rebellion. And the reason that it's rebellion is because I'm angry enough to say, God, I need you to do something about it. Prayer is asking God to change something. It's asking Him to intervene. It's asking Him, I don't like it the way that it is. This is wrong. It's wrong. And God, we need you to do something. How many problems can the church confront today? I believe with all of my heart that it is the church. It is the church and primarily the church. And the reason that Jesus goes to religious people before he goes anywhere else, it's the church that has the right answers to the problems the world faces today and nowhere else. Because it's the church who has the right answers with the right authority to stand up for what's right. And nowhere else. It's not that nothing else matters, but it's that the church was supposed to be God's primary way of influencing and changing the world. And it's people in the church that make up the church that get those things done. The church has the right authority and the right power to change things. But what it takes is people in the church who are angry that it is the way that it is. We don't believe that marriages have to end in separation or divorce. We don't believe that children have to go hungry. We don't believe that what the world says about life and sexuality has to be the truth. And so the church, yeah, the church is angry about those things and stands up in light of those things because we're angry. Prayer. Prayer starts to win that war. Prayer. Prayer over people. Prayer over illness. Prayer over relationships breaking. It's enough awareness to pray because we're angry. Now, as it relates to the resurrection, we'll celebrate Easter in a couple of weeks. This time of preparation on Sundays, do you need some cleansing? I think what this story shows us about man, especially before Easter, is that sometimes even religious people need to be cleansed. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes even people who are religious need to be cleansed. There were those around this situation that were in the temple at that time who were not taking advantage of the poor. But they knew about it. And they needed cleansing, I think. And Jesus, in this very physical, visible way, cleanses to motivate people to be cleansed. They weren't actively doing anything, but they weren't actively doing anything. And I think Jesus wanted to show them that cleansing is a real thing and that he's the one to do it. So listen, this is not a step on your toes kind of thing. It's just a question for you to answer yourself do you need cleansing you who are not religious or you who are religious do you need cleansing at the very least this story shows us that jesus is the one to do it whatever it takes jesus is the one who can cleanse and so maybe you're not actively taking advantage of people i don't think anybody here is 
If you are, you need cleansing. But if you're not, do you need it? Do you need cleansing? You're a religious person and you just know, yeah, there's something that's not right. And it's easy to just say, for those of us who are religious, yeah, the temple needs to be cleansed. They need to be cleansed. If they got it together. Now, what about you? Jesus wants to be one with you so much that he's willing to come in the middle of church and throw over a table. That's how willing he is to make you one with him. That's how much he loves you. See, his anger doesn't just stop at anger. His anger ends in love. Because he knows what he's about to do. He knows what's fixing to happen. Anger doesn't just stop by itself. Anger ends in love. So before Easter, Jesus cleanses the temple. And it's because he loves you. It's because he wants to cleanse those that need cleansing. Unreligious people, non-religious people, but also religious people. So listen, do you need cleansing? Do you need it? The good news of the gospel is that cleansing is available not because of what you do, but because of what he did. Because he achieved. So wherever you are this morning, my prayer would be that you would see Jesus as the one who can do for you what you need. Do you need cleansing? We end every time that we're together with an opportunity for you to do that. Maybe you say, I'm not angry enough or I'm not angry about the right things and I want to commit my life to do just that. You can take care of that where you are or we can pray with you and for you for that. But maybe, maybe you're a really good, genuine, religious person, but you just know deep down somewhere, I need some cleansing. And Jesus is the one who offers and provides. And Jesus is the one who will do whatever it takes to make sure it happens. He will. We'll help you. See Jesus to the best of our ability by praying with you and praying for you, by loving on you. If you want to make something right between you and the Lord or between you and somebody else, we're ready to do that as well, to love on you a little bit. Let us know what we can do for you while together we stand and while we sing.